Hello, my dog lovers. Hi. I think that we are on. I think, hi, Alicia. Hi, <laughs> welcome you. back. Good to thank see you. you. Happy thank Thursday. You. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here, you guys. Um, I was even prepared ahead of the time, actually, until I realized that my mask wasn't working and I had to make tea and get my water ready so I can power myself nicely. And I'm here. Um, so good to see you. Um, and, and knowing that you're out there uh, makes me feel really good because uh, the reason why I'm here every Thursday is you and your dogs and my kind of uh, my imagination that, that you're sitting there at the screens uh, wanting to learn how to keep your dog healthy. And because I am here for the same reason, you're here. I love my dog. You love your dog. And we are learning together. Um, I've been in practice for 30 years, so I have a little bit of an experience with dogs and how to keep them healthy. And I'm kind of nosy when it comes to anything that I was taught at vet school, anything that I was, um, I was taught is true. I like to explore the facts and I like to explore whether truly the recommendations that are commonly accepted are based on, on reality or not. And today's topic is the topic of calcium and phosphorus and their ratio and how to make sure that your dog will grow well and strong uh, from puppyhood all the way to adulthood and beyond. And it is not that easy because when I started looking at the different, um, when I started looking at the different numbers, I realized that they're really not based in practical world in the real world and it always blows me away and today I'd like to I'd like to share the information that I have uh, kind of put together with you and also um, give you some time to ask questions so I'm going to share a screen here and there and then I'll be switching back and forth as I always do um, you know I know that most of you worry about your dogs I think that worrying about our dogs is absolutely, absolutely normal. As some of us worry more or less, I personally do my best to worry less because I know that the worry doesn't help really anything. But what helps is to learn how to keep our dogs healthy. What helps is to learn what other people do, what mistakes they make and how they can reflect in uh, their dogs and our dog's health. Um, I chose this picture because it just kind of um, expresses how I feel. Our dog, our dogs are at our mercy. They, uh, they are, they really are, they really are um, the, how would I say that? They're captive to our decisions. They're captive to where we go, what we do, where we put them, what, what we feed them. All that is up to us. So, Similar to children, they're kind of helpless in their own way. And that's why I find it extremely meaningful and super fulfilling to actually be there for them and be there for you as well, of course. You know, sometimes I feel like I would like to be the fly on the wall in veterinary clinics. Um, the one disadvantage that vets do or that vets have is that we don't really go to veterinary offices for appointments. Uh, <laughs> we make appointments with ourselves. And that's why we don't really know what other people do and how they practice. Um, once in a while, it happens that I get um, to see what other people do or go on YouTube and hear other people what they say. But in general, it's very difficult for me to know how other people practice, how they conduct themselves with their clients and with their patients and all that. So all we have left is left is to do our best. And, uh, and um, you know, maybe one day we'll get a little bit more opportunity to share um, that part of our practice. Anyway, I'm going to go to the next slide. Let me just see. So, um, the topics that I often hear about are food, vaccines, 
and then how to raise healthy puppies, and then obviously different kinds of diseases. And today I'm going to focus on food. Next time, I think that I'm going to do a little bit of a review of vaccination because when I go out and when I talk to dog lovers undercover, I love being undercover when people don't know I'm a vet because then I can learn all these different things, what they do and what they don't do and what they think of us and all that. It's really comical sometimes. But the thing that I'd like to talk about is uh, food today. So, um, you know, food is a, is a tricky part. Um, everyone has an opinion. Um, I have an opinion. Everyone has an opinion. I think that the most important part is not what kind of opinion we have, but what results we get with what we do. And because I've had the opportunity to see thousands and thousands of dogs and compare uh, the different nutritional styles and kibble versus raw and, 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 and cooked, uh, I feel much more comfortable than I used to, to actually pass the information on to you with, with a degree of confidence. Um, it, it is an extreme, I, I'm very grateful for that gift of being able to sit down with thousands of, of patients and my clients over the 30 years, even though it makes me old, uh, which I, you know, old meaning it's all relative. Uh, longevity and health span is actually another goal of mine. And I am kind of passing that information onto your dogs, onto you. And that's going to be our mission. So if any of you think, oh, he's poking his nose into human nutrition and that and that, I actually do because I think that uh, it's not much different. And um, being 56, almost 57, I can, I think that I have enough proof that I have kept myself off drugs. I mean, conventional drugs, prescription drugs or any other drugs and, and also of, um, of um, any need for any intervention, touch wood, uh, medical intervention. So anyway, uh, going back to food, I love Alicia. She sometimes nods and she agrees and uh, is very quiet and stern when she disagrees. I don't really know. I haven't seen that face yet today. <laughs> mm. uh, isn't it, Alicia? I know that you're gonna give me a heck after. after. Anyway, so you know the, the, the problem is, um, the problem is um, that we are going to touch today is phosphorus and calcium. I love the Perry table because it kind of gives me a little bit of a um, uh, structure to all the different minerals and elements. And I also have learned a lot about minerals and, 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 um, and homeopathy in the past. And I talked, I talked um, about different minerals and how they, how they relate to uh, life stages and uh, different uh, characteristics of a patient. And it's so interesting, but today we'll kind of cone it down to the simple two elements, which is calcium and phosphorus. Now, calcium and phosphorus is discussed very, very often in, um, in nutrition and veterinary medicine, because we know if these are out of proportions that dogs may suffer different abnormalities in growth and development. And this doesn't normally happen in nature. Um, it started happening when people invented processed food because processed food has um, carries several different issues with it. One of them is that it's really dense. It's super dense. Therefore, the normal natural ratio of water and nutrients would be very different. Uh, the other thing is that since we realized that kibble has been actually problematic, we started kind of trying to figure, as, as, as veterinary profession started to tr try to figure how to, how to uh, establish the right ratio and how to feed our dogs so they don't develop with, with bone problems and joint problems and issues and hip dysplasia and all that. And it became really, wild because when you look at the current recommendations uh, that are available they're really confusing and sometimes very broad ranges are suggested i went to the merck veterinary manual which is kind of the veterinary bible in a way um, it has all sorts of different information about veterinary medicine and, and from, from treating diseases to nutrition and all that and in the manual it said that the recommended or allowed um, 
amount of calcium should be two to 18 grams of calcium per, per thousand calories. I like the fact that they said thousand calories because the food density matters, right? Uh, if, you, if you start adding the food per, let's say 100 grams or thousand grams or one pound of food, dehydrated food or, or raw food, that's different. So you really always have to measure the calories, but how do you measure calories easily and simple? That's another thing that we'll discuss. So the recommendation is two to 18 grams of calcium per thousand calories and 2.5 grams of phosphorus per thousand calories. But when you look at it, that's kind of a wide range and it really does put the calcium high up. And if you have a growing puppy, uh, we know that the calcium should not be 18 grams per thousand calories. It definitely shouldn't. Now, then I went to more information from AFCO. And uh, basically, AFCO suggested that um, ideally puppies after weaning, uh, when they're weaned off, uh, should be getting somewhere around 3 grams um, of calcium and 2.5 grams of phosphorus per thousand calories, which comes down to the ratio of 1.2 to 1, and in adult dogs, 1.3 to 1, because it's 1 gram and 70, 0.75 grams. Now, I'm not going to bore you with too many numbers, because I can already guess that what you're thinking, well, how am I going to measure 1,000 calories of food, and how am I going to measure whether I'm feeding the right amount of calcium and phosphorus to my dog? And the good news is that at the end of this uh, session, I'm going to give you a simple solution, simple suggestion that is well, well proven for thousands and tens of thousands of years. So you won't need to worry about calculating anything. But um, I would like to explain a little more about what, you know, what, what's going on in the world of nutrition. So if you look at the, the further guidelines, you know, I, I, I really tried hard over the last few days to come to some sort of concise information about what we should do with large breed puppies and what we should do with small breed puppies and whether there is some sort of way of actually making sense of all these numbers without really going crazy and worried that we cannot really practically apply it. And um, the next number that I came to in um, at a website, which is called Veterinary Information Network, which is basically kind of the Wikipedia for veterinarians, but more so it's professional site where uh, board certified diplomats share their information about what, what should be done with dogs and medically, you know, what, how to make the best medical decisions. Well, um, the numbers that, that I found there uh, was, were a little different. The, they said that, that large breeds should be calcium to phosphorus ratio of one to 1.5. So you can see that they reduced the calcium ratio from 1.2 to 1. And, um, and uh, puppies, just general puppies, small puppies, regular medium-sized dog puppies would be 1.2 to 1. So again, large breed puppies, they recommend lower calcium ratio, which makes sense because we don't want large dogs to grow too fast. But the problem is how do you determine how much calcium and phosphorus is there per thousand calories? And, and there is another problem with determining, let's say that there is a very sophisticated lab that can measure all this and that you feed the kibble that will have exacted those recommended amounts. Um, it's still not as simple because there is not calorie, calorie does not equal calorie. And I will explain that um, in a moment. Um, there's obviously different between difference between uh, the calorie density and bioavail bioavailability. Now, if you think of uh, bioavailability, think about think about it as um, as the the body's ability to digest certain food and basically make it available to the cells. I usually give a good example of uh, bioavailability by comparing the bowel movement of dogs on raw food or cooked food, wholesome food, and then kibble. I am sometimes blown away that from what my 55 pound dog packs, poops, in comparison to what a 20 pound 
dog on kibble poops, the 20 pound dog will poop about three times as much volume than packs, and maybe even five times. <laughs> I'm usually just blown away how much of a difference there is. So, you know, if you want to carry a pack sack for the poop, feed your dog kibble. And, and, and once again, I'm not necessarily saying if you're feeding kibble, you're wrong. I know that everyone makes their decision and there are many different reasons why either you feed kibble or raw. But on the level of calorie density and bioavailability, and also on, uh, from the point of view of, of healthy development, it is super important to, to know that it's, it's very difficult to kind of regulate the okay. nutrients and, and uh, feed kibble. Paxi, Paxi, come on, come on. <laughs> Pax just got a bone. I gave him lamb shank thinking that he's gonna be quiet for the whole hour. And right now he decided that he may not be quiet and he wants to get out. But now um, he's listened to my request and he's lying down. Good. Shh. <laughs> uh, so, you know, there's, there's a difference between dry food and raw food or cooked food, much less volume, about two thirds of the volume of, of, of fresh food. Sorry, um, two thirds volume less volume. <laughs> I just tangled it in it. Um, so if you have raw food, it's about, um, and dry food, the dry food is about two thirds less volume than the raw food. I hope this is clear. Um, I came across a really interesting statement when I was just kind of doing my research and reading, uh, preparing for this little presentation at VIN, Veterinary Information Network. It says, overnutrition in large breeds, puppies, leads not only to heavier body weight, but also faster bone growth with abnormal bone remodeling. And in real life, I would compare it to a tree that is over fertilized that grows too fast, okay? So when you, when you use fertilizer in the garden and you use too much of it, suddenly the plants go crazy and they become really, they grow fast, but they're really weak, okay? This would happen with the tree, tomatoes, uh, anything that you over fertilize. And if you feed very high calorie uh, density food like kibble, uh, that will also happen because you will... <laughs> Paxi, Paxi, come on, come here. Come on, come on, come and say hi, come on. Oh, I hope he's not gonna be bugging me, you guys the whole presentation. Anyway, um, so think about it this way. If you feed puppy a certain amount of uh, dry food, the stomach has a certain capacity. They will not feel satiated until they eat about three times the amount, right? Than they would eat if they were fed either cooked or raw. So they're naturally overeating. And when they're overeating, they're getting more calories and they will grow faster. Okay, on top of that, it's very difficult for us to establish the exact calcium and phosphorus by availability, meaning that there may be certain amount measured, but it doesn't necessarily mean that all of it will actually absorb in the body. So there will be a whole bunch of imbalances that you cannot control. Now, um, I'm going to share the screen one more time because um, this next slide will be super important. This is what I have seen on the right side in dogs that are fast growing and they're genetically predisposed to uh, hip dysplasia. You can see on the left side with the green arrow, the, the sockets of the hip joints are really nice and deep and the head of the femoral head um, sitting nicely in the socket. Now on the right side, you can see that the socket is shallow and also the, the femoral head is, um, is kind of displaced. I have not seen many cases of hip dysplasia. I, I, I actually don't think that I've seen one or maybe one and that it was a dog that was mixed uh, kibble slash raw food. But I have not seen other clear cases of hip dysplasia in dogs that would be on raw food and bones and balanced food. And I always pay attention to how to balance the diet meaning that uh, you can't really make, uh, make a wrong decision when you're feeding raw food or, or uh, cooked food if you don't know what you're doing. But if you know what you're doing, the ratio goes really down uh, and hip dysplasia rarely, rarely happens. Um, I 
know that some of you may kind of question and ask, well, you know, if my dog is predisposed to hip dysplasia, then it's done. You know, I can feed whatever food it is and, uh, and, and he or she will still get hip dysplasia. This is not true. The genetic information that is passed onto your dog plays a role, but only about 10 to 15% role in uh, the overall um, manifestation of those genes. The rest is epigenetics. And I talk about epigenetics quite often because it's the external factors. I mean, external uh, out of the gene factor, it can be internal environment of the body and it can be also the external environment. In this case, it will be the internal environment of the body by getting certain amount of food and so on. And I will grab my doggy and Alicia will actually um, take over for a moment and I will have to put him in line. Max always likes to be included. He's used to having his photo taken and being front and center. So I think he just really wants to be part of Facebook uh, Live today is what oh I'm guessing. Goodness. Oh Hi, Pax. Well, you know, this is, uh, this is a good demo uh, because Pax has been, he's a dog that uh, is 55 pounds and he's been on raw food since he was um, eight weeks because his mama was worried about raw food. So she didn't really feed him raw food. But uh, I'll show you some pictures later because, um, you know, besides raising many, many puppies or helping to raise puppies of my clients, I also have a firsthand experience with uh, two of my dogs, Sky and also Pax. So, um, Paxi, you're not, Paxi, lie down. Paxi. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. So, anyway, going back to what we were talking about here. <laughs> I would like to share another slide with you and another growth abnormality. Um, and uh, that is going to be right here. I normally have a harness nearby and I would put him on the harness, but I don't know where it is. So I'm just gonna leave him. I hope he is not disturbing you too, too much. So the other growth issues that we get when dogs eat too much or puppies eat too much and two calorie dense uh, food is uh, lesions of cartilage. Uh, we call it osteochondritis, uh, which in simple terms is basically um, an inflammation of the, of the cartilage and uh, separation of the cartilage, uh, uh, which is called dissecans. So osteochondritis dissecans is actually uh, a term for a condition where the cartilage grows too fast. And you know, if you think of something growing too fast, it actually, then the cartilage, let's say the bone grows too fast and the joint grows too fast and the cartilage will actually separate or split because it's not strong enough and it grows too fast, right? So there's too much tension and pressure. Suddenly it separates and we get a little joint fragment, uh, cartilage fragment in the joint and that needs to be removed. The other thing that happens sometimes and that's on the right side here, that the radius and the ulna, the foreleg uh, bones um, will grow unevenly and it will result in what we call hip dysplasia. Okay, so all those abnormalities are actually a result of- Sorry to interrupt. Um, can you um, share screen? It oh didn't come up goodness. for some reason. Yeah, oh, sorry. You know why it didn't come up, Alicia? I know exactly why. Because I missed it. There we up. go. <laughs> we can see it now, thank so, you. So osteochondritis, uh, you can see the lesion in the cartilage on the left here. There's a dark spot, um, separation of cartilage, and there's probably a little, Little, little cartilage mouse floating somewhere in the, in the joint. And on the right-hand side, a radius in the front and ulna in the back, uh, if they grow unevenly as a result of fast growth, um, there can be an incongruent surface of the joint and we call it elbow dysplasia. It also may end up with a little bit of a separation of a little bone segment um, right here. So, uh, you know, in practical terms, this is this is what it kind of looks like. You know, we we see dogs that are not really healthy looking. They they kind of they kind of look like their body is um, just just out of balance. And and um, you've seen probably German Shepherds and Great Danes and Weimaraners and other dogs, especially the large dogs, that look like this. So. Um, you know, I talked about the bioavailability and, and um, you can see that I put uh, chunks of meat and also uh, a tree trunk. And 
the reason why I put those two together is that both of them, both of these ingredients are actually part of processed food. <laughs> if you look at many of these uh, recipes of processed food, they quite, quite often have powdered cellulose, which is basically, um, you know, processed wood chips. Uh, cellulose is the main material for paper making. So if you want to, if you want to feed your dog paper, um, you can actually feed one of the kibble recipes uh, that are out there uh, from the scientifically based food manufacturers and you will basically feed paper plus some other ingredients. The reason why I'm saying this is that um, if you analyze paper and meat, they will have some nutrients that are very similar, but they will not be the same bioavailability. Right. So if you do an analysis uh, and even calorie content, we know that wood, wood chips and paper have calorie content because when we burn them, they release certain amount of calories. Doesn't necessarily mean that those are digestible by available calories. Right. So that's the that's the biggest challenge that we are dealing with uh, when it comes to kibble and also establishing the right phosphorus ratio. Um, you know, Cellulose is um, cardboard, basically. So <laughs> I find it always very interesting when I figure out that part of the ingredients in the, in, the, in the food recipes is cardboard. So what is fat does not mean that it's available. What is fat is, what is, fat is not what is available to your dog. Now, I always like to do a little bit of digging around uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to the sources and who also educates us. And I came across this uh, Global Nutrition Committee, which sounds very good, right? Uh, can you still see the browser, Alicia, or not? Um, I can see the slide, but uh, okay. the link didn't I'm come through. To, mm -hmm. Okay, I will actually share a different screen here. So Global Nutrition Committee, I, I came across this um, document at World Small Animal Veterinary Association Conference. I'm not sure what, what year it was uh, from, but you know it, it looks really good. I'm just browsing the website. Uh, it's public information, so uh, there shouldn't be any problem with me sharing it. Um, you know, when you look at it, um, the, the, the committee has been established to basically educate in the field of nutrition. And uh, you can see that there's also student nutritional education and uh, they uh, do some lectures on nutritional evaluation in dogs and cats first year of veterinary school and third year of veterinary school and so on, and, and also week long course. This is all really nice because you go, okay, you know, um, education is being done and all that is not nice and dandy until you go down on the pages and you discover that all this is sponsored by Purina Institute, Royal Canin and um, Hills. So then you go, well, is this really an unbiased information or is it wolf in, uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, goat being a gardener, right? <laughs> Meaning that uh, I've been saying for years that uh, that the veterinary education is happening under a very heavy influence of uh, pet food companies. And I know pet food companies are, are in business of making food. So I'm not necessarily going to be uh, making them worse than they are. They're just basically making a living with something that they possibly even believe is the right way to go but I don't really like them being involved in uh, veterinary education because that should be unbiased. And um, you should also know what goes on. So uh, what, how do we solve all this? How do we, how do we actually, um, how do we resolve this, this quandary of, of processed food and, and uh, calcium and phosphorus ratios, and the fact that it is pretty much impossible practically to determine how much you're giving because of the bioavailability, because of the calorie density, because it's really difficult to measure. And uh, you're just a human being. You're not, a, you're not a supercomputer and I'm not a supercomputer. So if someone asks me, comes, they come in the practice and they say, well, you know, is my kibble, is this kibble the right kibble for my dog? I'll just say, I, I don't really know because there's so many variables, but there's one really easy to follow solution. And I did tell you that I will share a method that has been proven by thousands and tens of thousands of years. And that is the method that nature uses. How many times you've heard a mother telling you 
that she has been measuring her baby's calcium and phosphorus and magnesium and all that. She doesn't. What she does, she's actually giving balanced diet. How many times have you seen elephants really worrying about <laughs> calcium and phosphorus ratios? I haven't. How many times have you seen big cats actually worrying whether they're getting the right phosphorus and, and calcium ratio? They just don't. Because you know what happens in nature? Nature has it also figured that we have evolved perfectly for the food that we are supposed to eat the same way the, the big cats and the elephants and all that. And when it comes to dogs, we kind of try to mimic their food, the food that they would be eating in nature. Now, some of you may object, say, you know, this is not scientifically based, and then there's going to be big arguments about whether we should be feeding veggies or not, and bones or not, and raw and cooked and all that stuff. I don't think that you need to obsess about that as much as watching and looking at the results. And because I have raised two of my dogs on raw food, I also have helped thousands of clients um, establish the right food and seeing what the results are with different genetic makeup, different breeds, different sizes and all that. I can say with confidence that, that what we suggest actually should work in most dogs. I'm not saying all dogs because it's not possible. There can be some sort of genetic abnormality that will express. It's really hard to give you any guarantees, but I will share or I'm sharing with you what I do with my dog. Uh, we have created, you know, for, for years, we've had so many people saying, oh, you know, we, we want recipes. Peter, make recipes. And, and my team has been bugging me for ages to make recipes. And I go, you guys, I don't want to make recipes. I don't want to write recipes. You know what I'll do? I'll make a software or we'll put together a program that will actually or a tool that will help you make recipes. So now we actually have that. And I'm just going to share... Um, Oops, uh, maybe I'm going to share the whole screen. That way it's easy. So um, we have put together a recipe maker and the recipe maker uh, is really simple. Some of you have seen it, some of you have not. It kind of explains why we recommend raw diet, that there is a different digestive tract in herbivores and carnivores and that our dogs should not be getting the food that is in kibble uh, quite often. And even if it's grain free, it's still not a natural state. Then, um, oops, ah, la la, what did I do? <laughs> then uh, I close this and you can just click start and you will, you will kind of fill out some of the information and then you start choosing the ingredients and you look at some information about the different meats and then you go next and then you can choose the different vegetables and then you go next and then you can choose the organs. Uh, even though I'm not as concerned about organs when we give supplements anymore because I've seen good results with that too and sometimes you just can't get them. Um, I'm gonna say I don't wanna add organs and then we can do give bones and all that stuff. Now, I am not going to be uh, giving you full course on nutrition today and how to put together a raw diet. But what I'm going to do instead, oh, I, even, I was not sharing. I'm sorry, Alicia, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back and I'll show you how this works. So you can see that you can actually choose the different meats and then you can choose the different vegetables and also see which ones are good for dogs and which ones are not. The yellow are less good, green are okay and so on. Then you choose or don't choose the, I chose no organs and uh, I'm gonna choose some bones if I want to. But as I said, I'm not going to give you a full course on raw diet making, just knowing you just remember that this tool exists and that you can use it, you can share with others and it's completely free. It makes me super happy that I can offer it to you. So um, what do we do about, um, the different sizes of dogs. Because again, the argument that some pet food companies make is that different breeds, different sizes have to get different food. So, you know, I'm a nosy person and I like to, I like to just kind of also put logic into medicine and common sense and make it simple. 
So then I start asking, well, there are several canines, several canine species in the world. And here are just some of them. You can just go on Wikipedia and look for Canidae, the family Canidae, and you will see that there's wolves and foxes and raccoons and, and all these different cool animals. But they're different sizes, even though they look the same size here, they're different sizes. And then I ask, well, so do they get different food or do they get similar food or the same food? They, they pretty much get the same food. And the only way or the only reason we need to feed a small breed or large breed different food is when we feed them food that is really not species appropriate. And also when we want to give our customers the impression that canine nutrition is super complicated and that we need to buy the exact food for the particular brood or breed or for, for the particular size. And just can you kind of tell, you know, dog lovers, you don't know what you're doing. We pet food company have to tell you what to do. And we've created these really cool categories for large breeds and small breeds and so on. Well, it is not necessary. And I will say that with confidence because we have seen it many times over. I've had little chihuahuas, little mini breeds to Great Danes, and I've seen them grow really nicely and strongly. So um, don't believe everything that you're told. And I wanted to actually take even what I say with kind of like a healthy degree of skepticism and make your own, create your own opinion about what I'm saying and whether it makes sense to you or not. Um, you know, when you look at all the different canines, small, large uh, chihuahuas and poodles and border collies and uh, golden retrievers and gray danes and wolf hunts, um, they had the same dentition. And if you talk to any biologist, they will tell you that the way a species teeth develop is closely, very tightly related to what food they should be getting. And that's why I'm saying it with confidence, there should be no difference between the food for small dog or large dog, with the exception that small dogs may eat a little more per pound and large dog, dogs may have a little slower metabolism. And that you should be ideally uh, feeding large dogs enough to grow well, but if you feed them high calorie dense processed food that is two thirds less in volume, you will most likely make them grow fast and you will probably cause the abnormalities or sometimes may cause the abnormalities that I've showed you just a few slides ago. So, um, you know, the other thing that I wanted to mention and I mentioned many times before, uh, this is something that, I, whoa. <laughs> uh, I tell you what just happened. Uh, I have these uh, little hanging men over our fireplace and um, and I wanted them to be hidden because they just kind of look like they're hung hung on the rope, right? And uh, I just kind of tucked them up uh, higher up and realized that they just fell down. Anyway, um, what I'm sharing today is what I do with my dog. And I've learned over times, and, and even my dog Sky and Pax taught me that there's a difference between diet with supplements and diet without supplements. And the reason why I'm saying that is simple. Uh, Sky did not get any supplements for the first seven or eight years of his life. And if you go onto my Facebook and go a few years back, even many years back to 2007 or eight when we started, you will see that Sky looked good, but he looked nowhere as good as Pax did or does. And um, I started to kind of look into supplementation in 2008, nine and, and started giving Sky supplements. And, and there was a difference. And there's a difference that you can read about um, in our reviews of different products and supplements. I know now that soils are depleted, that we cannot really get all the nutrients from food anymore because we have been overusing soils. In nature, the nutrients would be really circulating nicely from the grass and, and herbs and plants to herbivore, carnivores, and then back to the soil. 
And that would happen in a very relatively small, in a relatively small area. But if you grow crop of corn in Mexico or California or bring it up to Canada, the compost is not going to go back to the soils in California or Mexico. And therefore the soils become depleted and farmers just cannot supplement the nutrients. It's, it's, it's unfeasible. It's not, not doable. So um, the transportation of food is one problem and we have um, solved it by giving raw food with supplements. Now, if you go to the link um, on my site, which is called Essentials, you will, you will see um, uh, quite a bit of information about what supplements, what the essential nutrients are. There are minerals and amino acids, omega oils, vitamins, and probiotics. Now, here are the four, we call them fabulous four. Actually, one of our clients uh, and customers started calling them fabulous four and we thought it was funny. So we did. And you have uh, videos on all the products or most of the products and information. You can click and you can research. This is what I give packs six out of seven days. Now you may find it funny. This is what I take six days out of seven with the exception of Gutsense, which is canine specific probiotic. Now, canine specific means that it is a specific flora, microflora for the gut of a dog. So it's not good for me. Um, I am, and this is something that I haven't disclosed before uh, in kind of like a public broadcast or live broadcast, we are preparing a human line of these supplements because I, number one, wanted to finally tune them for humans a little more, even though nutrients are nutrients, they're good good for humans, good for dogs. But I also wanted to capsulate them for humans. It's easy for us to add the supplements to dog food in powder, but you know, if you've ever eaten spirulina in powder, it's not anything tasty. It's, I don't have really good way of, uh, what I do actually now, I put them in lemon, lemon water or yogurt with a little bit of honey, but it's still disgusting. But dogs don't mind it and, um, and, these are the results. Now, I've had many, I'll show you this slide. I've had many people, not many, but some people arguing with me, well, you know, um, how do you know that your, your diet is balanced and these recipes are balanced? And if you go on uh, webinars and podcasts and um, websites of pet food companies that make kibble, they will always argue that, that the food that we recommend is not balanced, not necessarily our company, but generally. Now, I'd like them to kind of debate this. My year and a half old dog that has never been on kibble from the age of eight weeks has gotten supplements. Is there any problem with that? Is there any problem with you guys reporting that, that, that your dogs are doing well on raw food and better than on kibble? Um, I think that proof is in the pudding and, and you know, we, they, can, they, can, they can talk us into um, some sort of nonsense once in a while, but then you see the results and the difference. And, and me having a 30 years of experience, I would never go back to kibble. I would never go back to kibble because there is one thing that I, I know for sure. I know no medical doctors, no human doctors who would say that wholesome food is worse for you than processed food. So why is it this, this way in medicine? I let you answer the, 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 the question. Um, there, is, uh, there should not be any difference between the diet for puppies, adult dogs, and seniors. With the exception of some medical conditions like very advanced kidney disease that I have talked about a few weeks back. Uh, but. The reason for that is, the reason why I don't recommend different diet for puppies, adult dogs, and seniors is that nature never feeds different food to a young eagle, mid-age mid eagle, middle-age eagle, and old eagle, um, old whale, young whale, old wolf, puppy wolf. It's all the same food, you guys. And once again, it's just a marketing plot to make you believe that you just cannot do it yourself, right? And it's really complicated. It's not. So when it comes to phosphorus calcium ratio, just feed well-balanced food 
don't overfeed your dog, especially when you have a large breed and, and, and he or she is a puppy in the puppy stage. And it's simple. You don't really need to solve what nature has already solved for you thousands and tens and hundreds of thousands years back. And I know some of you will say, well, you know, I have a, I have a, I have a dog. He's been on kibble for 15, 16, 17 years, and he was doing fine. I also know the grandmas that smoke and they're 90, right? But is, the, is that the average? Is that the average outcome and result? It is not. And that's why I love sitting here. I love talking to you. I know that some of you may disagree with me. Some of you may agree. To be honest, I'm fine with it. Because if everyone agreed with me, that would be something wrong with what I'm saying. It would mean that I'm trying to please everyone. But what I'm doing here is just kind of telling you what I do, what I think works, and how to keep your dogs healthy because I know how much your dog means to you. I see it from your pictures. I see it from your videos. I see it from the comments on Facebook page. And what I hope to do is to help you create healthy and fun life for you and your dog. And that's one of the reasons why I sometimes post pictures from our adventures and, 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 um, and travel and all that stuff, because all that is possible only when we create healthy life for our dogs and ourselves. So I'm not really necessarily saying that in the future, I will always focus only on dog health, because I think that I can also share some of the, some of the things that I've learned about human health and what works and what doesn't. But that's another story. And now we have questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was great information. And it's a topic that we hear so much about um, in the customer care team. So this is great. Um, Tracy has a question. Her question is, so if we give our dogs the green men and whole food, their bodies will take what it needs, i.e. phosphorus and calcium will be balanced, or is there more to it? You know, um, there, there is definitely, uh, if you, let's go back to nature a little bit. Um, there are different foods that have different, different uh, content of minerals and nutrients. And the body does have an amazing ability when the nutrients come in the, in the whole food form, when they're not synthetic, when they're not chemical, the body has an amazing ability to sort it all out. Um, meaning that it will store what it needs, it will throw off what it doesn't need. Uh, you know, kidneys, for example, can eliminate calcium and other minerals and so on. So when we suggest um, the average doses of uh, agreement, for example, the mineral support, the plant-based mineral support, we know that it's not gonna be exact, but we are kind of creating a smorgasbord of nutrients for the dog to choose. And if, they, if there's something more than they need, they will definitely be able to regulate it because this is whole food. This is not a chemical excess or synthetic nutrient excess. So if you go according to the label that, that there is, um, and, and agreement has been on the market for eight years, seven, eight years, I think, uh, you, will, you will achieve good health. You will achieve good balance of minerals. And there's also hair key test, uh, which is a uh, testing. And you can, you know, you can, you can, um, you can measure and see if there is a, if, if there's the right balance of, of minerals and, um, and nutrients. Um, sometimes it can happen that with certain medical conditions, let's say with inflammatory bowel disease, there can be low absorption of certain nutrients. So you may need to up, up the, uh, the, the supplementation. Um, some dogs may have genetically predisposed abnormality, how they metabolize certain nutrients as well, but that's very rare. But if you are, if your dog is not doing well and you're giving the supplements uh, as you should, um, then uh, do hair to test because it'll give you an idea of what, you know, what the levels are in your dog's that yeah, and that actually leads um, quite nicely into the next question. Um, we have a question from Debbie, who just got her results back from the hair cue test. Um, the phosphorus levels, in fact, were low and everything else was good. Um, should she be increasing something in the diet? Um, the dog is raw fed and on the Fab Four. Uh, they're also doing a cleanse right now. And I guess just to give some perspective to this, 
Um, Debbie, thanks for your question. Um, if you can maybe make a note in the comment as to how long you've been feeding natural food, as well as how long your dog has been on the supplements, that would help us maybe give some more information uh, because it does make a huge difference if the hair test sample has been collected, uh, say in September, um, Peter, can you expand on yeah, where yeah. the results are coming from? Maybe she's only been giving the supplements for four to six months. Yeah, so um, it takes about, so we usually collect about an inch of hair if you have a long hair dog or the, you know, all the hair in the short hair dog. And it takes about four months for the supplementation to reflect in the hair. So the hair grows and seals the minerals in that are floating in the plasma. And then we collect the hair and you measure it in the lab. Um, if your dog has um, low phosphorus only, and otherwise, you know, I would have to really see the, the whole test. And what I can do, Alicia will probably pull your test and we'll, we'll get in touch with you. But generally, um, if everything else is fine, I would say it's very unlikely that it would be causing any problems, but there may be a little bit of a storage depletion. I would have to know what food you're feeding, uh, what ingredients you're feeding and all that. So, uh, you know, I can't give you the answer right now, but I promise that Alicia and I will get our, we'll put our heads together and we'll get back to you. Okay. Yeah, we can definitely look into it. And Debbie has posted that um, her dog has been raw fed for about two years and has been on supplements for about a year now. Um, so given that the hair Q test would have been, if the results have just come back uh, based on when the hair sample was taken mm -hmm. and then working our way backwards, I think Debbie and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I would say that if you retest in six months, you'll probably see those levels increase to better levels. Would you agree with that? Uh, you know, I, I, as I said, like I would have to see actually what the, what the ratios are in some situations, I would say, you know, you can ultimately, you can look, um, look at foods that are high in phosphorus, but it, you know, it's meat and uh, grains and, and some other foods uh, and, and increase those. But um, if, if all the other elements and minerals are fine and the phosphorus is a little low, um, I would not really worry about it. I would keep an eye on it. But once again, I, I'd have to see the results and I have to make more, have more information. It should reflect in a year, if, you, if you've been feeding and giving the supplements for a year, it should reflect. So what you're seeing is the real thing. It's not like there's a delay. Uh, yeah, I, I'd have to see the results. Um, thank you. Great, we'll follow up on that. Um, the next question is from Natalie. Um, Natalie said that if she is feeding green men, which she understands has calcium, um, does she still need to feed raw bones? Um, she's asking because her dog doesn't have any interest in eating raw bones. You know, this is one of the good examples of how the body regulates calcium and other minerals and nutrients. Because I feed uh, bones to packs um, um, frequently, but not as often as, as Sky, because Pax is a dog that overheats. He's generally naturally hot. And all the bones that are really easily available are, you know, like chicken bones and, and others are heating. Uh, I could give him duck bones, which I used to, which I did when I was in the Czech Republic with him, which are cooling. Uh, I sometimes feed him beef ribs, but never give him beef shank bones because they can crack his teeth. Um, there's more information on that in one of the articles. But going back, uh, going back to whether you need to feed bone uh, bo uh, bones when you give green men. To be honest, no. Um, I've seen some dogs um, uh, being on green men only and not getting any bones and developing really well. Uh, there's enough calcium and other minerals in green men to actually supplement for the bones. But if you give green men, it doesn't only supplement uh, calcium, it supplements all the other trace minerals that quite often are missing. And that's why we see so much difference in um, giving green men or after we start green men in, in so many dogs and why people uh, rave about it because it, it's a really simple proof that our food is depleted of major of, of, of nutrients and micro and, and micronutrients. And that's why we see difference. You can sleep well, you can give green men, not, not feed any bones and your dog should be fine. Great, and if you're really you. worried or concerned, do a hair key test and see if, if the levels are okay. Mm -hmm. 
And something we hear a lot of, which was also posted in the comments, is that people feel overwhelmed by this topic. Um, you mentioned it during the presentation that a lot of these processed food companies make dog lovers feel like it's overwhelming because they're overcomplicating it. Um, how would you advise people that are curious and kind of looking to make the leap from processed food to natural food um, outside of the information we have on our site, like Recipe Maker? Um, you know, how do they get comfortable with doing this mm. when maybe their vet is selling processed food in the clinic and they feel sort of surrounded on all sides by that being the only way to go? Wow, how would I start? Um, take a deep breath and do it. Just do it. <laughs> Actually, start with maybe cooked food, vegetables, play with it, ask questions. We are here, we have customer service team members who actually answer questions of anyone, no matter whether you're our customers or buyer products or not. We just answer questions because we love doing that. And we've been able to figure out how to kind of carry the whole mission of giving people's, people advice and, 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 and carry it financially by obviously having success with the products, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to buy the products. We can give you an advice uh, how to put the recipes together. Um, do it if it makes sense to you. Um, I find it really interesting how many people are scared or how many people try to please their vet. But you know, your vet, if he or she believes in processed food only, is not going to actually be at the end responsible for your dog's well-being. And once again, I need to emphasize that there are no human doctors that recommend processed food over wholesome food. Why do we have to still have this discussion? It's like talking about whether water is wet, right? Or it's just, eh. but I understand why, because uh, there's still the pressure from pet food companies who make money and make living from making processed food. You know, there, there are several different industries that have kind of ended up in deep caca, I'm just going to say, by not really living, living their truth. One of the good examples, and I'm so delighted about that, is the automobile industry. I knew for, I've known for a long time that, that uh, they're stagnating the electromobile or, uh, or uh, electric car <laughs> evolution. Uh, but they kind of thought that they could do that forever, right? Until Elon Musk came and blew everyone, everyone's fuses. And now they're trying to catch up, but it's almost too late because people know that electric cars are viable. They're faster, they're funner, they're, they're just the future. And I know that natural food is the future even though there are some issues of, you know, meat production and all that, that's another thing because, you know, we cannot really make our dogs meat, eat beans and, and veggies only, that would not really end up well. But we can reduce our meat consumption to feed our dogs. So, you know, I'm not going to be kind of diving into the ethical nature of meat production because that's another story and we're doing our best to actually do edu educate people as well. But when it comes to process versus raw, <laughs> just do it. Yeah, it seems pretty straightforward it. for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and, we and have... ask for help, ask for help. Call anytime. Mm -hmm. Our team is definitely <laughs> here to answer lots of questions. You can call, you can email, and you can contact us on social media. Um, we do have two more questions if we have time to fit them in. Absolutely. Um, one is a quickie. Um, calcium, eggshells, what's your take on that? Some people like to yeah. ground them up and put them in the diet. Good, not good? From as far as I know, and um, I don't really have a firsthand experience, but based on the research and reading that I've done, eggshells are not as bioavailable and digestible as, as uh, raw bone calcium. There is a different composition of the eggshell to a certain degree, but you know, I, I just I wouldn't I wouldn't really recommend eggshells instead of bones. It just would not work. At least that's what I know. 
-hmm. and you can do more research and see whether there are any studies. <laughs> and I guess to the best of your knowledge, though, it's not um, a problem if someone was to feed it. It's not that they're doing damage. They just might not be getting um, or giving the calcium yeah. intended. Yeah, it is not, um, it, it, you know, it is not, it is not a problem to feed it. You don't need to pour ashes on your head. Uh, you can sleep well, but uh, it's unlikely. It's unlikely to provide the same nutritional value as um, as raw bones. Great. Um, and then a question from one of our community members, Wayne. Um, this is a bit of a, a snapshot in the diet of of Wayne's dog. Um, it says, "Hi, I feed a ready raw mix." Um, 80, 20, 20 uh, percentages, I guess. He gives big country raw salmon and turkey and deer. So I guess three different proteins that are either being given at once or maybe being cycled through. Um, I do that to change up the meat variety. Um, I also add some supplements and I give kefir um, plus my dog gets a duck neck once a week, sometimes twice a week. Is there anything else I should be doing or changes I could make um, to improve mm. the diet? So we've got the rotation mm. of proteins, um, a little bit of, I guess, organ, perhaps veggie. We don't go into details in the, in the comment discussing veggie. Um, kefir is a question. We get questions on sometimes as well. I see. Um, I see. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, and that's Wayne, right? Wayne, yes. Wayne, thank you so much for asking this question. Um, I, you know, I assume that you're not feeding any plant material or vegetables and I, or maybe you do actually 20, you said uh, 60, 20, 20, I assume 60 meat, 20 uh, bones and then 20 vegetables. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I like, I, I, I'm, I'm a little concerned about the amount of fish that you're feeding. Uh, either it's farm salmon or wild salmon, but there's more likely to have mercury contamination. And I've seen that even with um, uh, moderately polluted salmon, salmon is considered to be relatively low in mercury. It still can, the levels of mercury can still go high up. Um, I think that you're doing a reasonable job giving at least three different um, um, kinds. You know, I always am super happy when I, when I get to Europe with, with packs because I can I can get all the different game meats, uh, elk and, and venison and pheasant and all these different goats. And, and, and it's really cool. Um, but here in North America, I find that it's not as easy to get these meats. Um, if you have any friends who are hunters and they are willing to share some of their, um, some of their meat with your dog, great, especially bones. Um, uh, when it comes to kefir, um, I'm sure that your dog is fine getting kefir, um, but when you really want to be um, uh, true raw food is according to nature. Nature never, um, there are no animals, no species that would actually consume milk post weaning, right? So that's something that you wanna remember, not to give it too often, duck necks, perfect. Um, uh, you know, try to try to increase the variety and, and, and play with the recipe maker. Um, uh, there's so many different combinations and I wouldn't obsess exactly about the ratio being the same every single day. Just keep it in mind that, um, that your dog should have somewhere between you know, 15 to 30% vegetables, depending how they do on vegetables. I find that dogs that get chilly and have a little um, less efficient digestive tract, they have less digestive fire. Uh, do better on less vegetables, and they sometimes refuse vegetables, as opposed to dogs that like to that that are get hot, like Pax, my dog. He would eat anything. He eat vegetables, and he eats. I give him more vegetables because they're relatively cooling, and I also try to choose the cooling meats, um, such as duck or the neutral meats, such as lamb. Um, and do not feed him as much chicken or poultry in general because it's really heavily heating. And I, you know, when I when I feed him these meats, I can see that he pants at night more, and he gets overheated. So there's so much to learn and so much to so much to discover. But don't be afraid. Use the recipe maker. Ask questions, and I think that you're doing overall a good job. Also, if you you know if you're not giving omega oils or probiotics or vitamins and minerals, if you give just some sort of supplement, 
just check the, you know, check your dog's um, levels of minerals, see where they are at, see whether his, his or her coat um, is good and healthy. Um, if you're happy with the overall general health, then you're doing a good job. If you think that there are some things that are not just right, um, I'm going to say try our fabulous four. <laughs> Absolutely. But, and uh, but you know, we're not, we're not, we're not the only company that makes supplements, but we do, I do believe that we have kind of pushed them to a little different level because we ferment most of these supplements and mm -hmm. fermentation increases the effectiveness, digestibility, bioavailability, increases antioxidant levels, reduces inflammation. There are so many benefits to that. And, and I actually, you know, we test the products first on humans. And then we give them to animals. I'm actually just in the process of testing one of our uh, new products uh, on me. Uh, it's almost ready to go to the next phase, which is testing on animals. <laughs> and speaking of products, I do want to circle back to probiotics because Wayne did mention kefir. Um, it is a question that comes up occasionally. What's your take on um, kefir versus a true uh, product like Gut Sense that's made based on um, canine sort of? <clears throat> Yeah. of what's going on in their, their bodies for probiotics? You know, kefir usually uh, contains limited amount of, uh, of the probiotic bacteria that is not specific to dogs. Um, dogs would live in a very different kind of setting in, in nature. They would not be exposed to the same bacteria. They have different diet. Therefore, you know, kefir, I... <laughs> I, I, I don't give milk uh, to packs and I, I just basically choose the non-dairy uh, kind of probiotics. Uh, if you don't want to use our probiotics, there may be some other probiotics that are non-dairy, uh, but I, I think it's better. It, it actually ensures better digestive balance. Dairy, you know, dairy is kind of funny because I'm, I'm going to try not to be gross, but, but milk is basically <laughs> a little little cleaner version of pus. <laughs> There's a lot of white blood cells and protein and different things in it, right? And, uh, and it does stimulate and sometimes overstimulate the immune system and digestive tract. I tell you that it took me two decades to actually realize that whenever I eat yogurt, even yogurt, fermented yogurt, that I get so exhausted and tired and I may have lactose intolerance but but it's um it's it's very interesting. I think that it's just beyond the the lactose. It's also that it is really there's a lot of allergens or allergenic potential allergenic ingredients or substances in milk. Or it acts basically. It, it challenges the immune system. Um, that's all. <laughs> Thank you Thank so much. You. Thanks. We had some great questions. Thanks for addressing yeah, them. And those question. we didn't get to, we'll try to get to around to by the end of the day. And next, uh, in two weeks, uh, next week, we are going to be reposting one of our broadcasts. And then in two weeks, we are going to be touching the topic of vaccination because I, I hear dog lovers out there telling me uh, what they're told and what they're doing with their dogs. And we need to, we need to kind of repeat that topic. So in two weeks, vaccinations. If you have any questions or, or people who you think uh, may want to attend, please let them know. And thank you so much for attending. Subscribe to our newsletter. We have also YouTube channel, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, we post a lot. And the subscription is the best way to make sure that you're not going to miss any information that is important for the health of your dog. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Alicia. <laughs> thank you. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.